So welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Melissa Basinger, Instructional Designer in the Academy for Teaching Excellence, and welcome to our part two of our webinar series, Transitioning to Fully Online Instruction. So last week in part one, we talked about bringing content into your course, and that webinar is available on harperacademy.net to watch part one. And today we're going to talk a lot about um, the student side of things, now that you've provided them content, what types of activities and assessments can the students kind of give back to you in the online environment? So you can earn CEUs for attending this webinar today, for attending all of the webinars in the session uh, in this series. So if you go to our, um, the, to harperacademy.net and you go to our fully online, um, transition to fully online webinar series, under each part, you will see that there is a personal action plan form that you can complete. And if you fill that out and submit the form by May 1st, you can receive 0.2 CEUs for attending this webinar. Now, as mentioned a couple times, this is part two in a series. So um, I already mentioned part one was last week, and we have another every Tuesday and Thursday up until April 16th at 10 a.m. Uh, we are going to be doing additional work, kind of building out a fully online course. So next uh, or this coming Thursday at 10 a.m., we'll be talking about providing feedback, feedback and working in the gradebook. So kind of moving from the assignments into the gradebook and feedback part. So please tune in or watch the recordings. And again, CEUs are available, 0.2 CEUs per session, if you fill out that form available on harperacademy.net. So our agenda for today, um, we're going to talk about going fully online, what it means. So we addressed that a little bit in part one, and we're just gonna revisit a couple of key points, uh, especially for those that uh, didn't attend the, the first part. Uh, Stephanie Valen, the chair of the Academy, is going to join us today, and she's gonna talk about compassionate pedagogy and especially what that means for class assignments in the online environment. Then we'll talk a little bit about, um, oops, One second, my slide stopped sharing. Let me share those again. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so then we'll move into uh, a little bit of best practices for assignments as it relates to that compassionate pedagogy and what it means to be fully online. And we'll actually go into Blackboard and I'm gonna demo some different assignment types that you can do in a Blackboard course. So we'll talk about a few different things to think about as you work on your online course in the next days. We'll have some Q&A time at the end of the session, but we're also going to take Q&A breaks throughout the session. So I'm going to pause, um, and you can always submit questions in the chat at any time, and Janet and the Academy will be moderating. But I will break to allow Janet or other members of the Academy to uh, ask direct questions at me to respond as we go through the different the different pieces. So we won't necessarily have a long Q&A portion at the end, but we'll have kind of mini Q&A breaks throughout. But again, you can always post questions in the chat as we go. All right, so let's talk about going fully online, what it means. So as was announced last week, Harper is moving all classes to a fully online format for the remainder of spring 2020 and for summer 2020. And this is for the safety and health of all Harper students, faculty, and staff. So just for the rest of this week, we are in a flexible off-campus instruction mode until next Monday, April 13th, at which point all classes should have materials and a structure in place to be considered fully online. Now, as we talk about what fully online means, some of you may find that the strategies you've taken during this flexible off-campus instruction period have really already gotten you and your students to that point. And you can largely continue to operate as you have been since March when we left the physical campus. Some of you may find that you need to make some adjustments still to get your class fully online, and that's okay. 
So that's what this webinar series is here to help with. And that's what the flexible off-campus instruction period was designed for. So you had a little time to, to build some of these materials. So you're taking a great step uh, by attending this webinar. So we'll be focusing on spring 2020 today um, and showing examples in a spring 2020 shell. But all of these principles and approaches discussed throughout the webinar series also apply to a summer 2020 course. If you are in that boat of needing to prepare a summer 2020 course as well. So let's talk a little bit about what fully online means. So fully online means that your teaching, the students learning and your communication with students is all still happening. But rather than happening from say 11 to 12, 15 p.m. every Tuesday and Thursday in a specific location on campus, this is happening asynchronously. So a true asynchronous fully online learning experience means that each week or at some other regular inter interval, you're providing your students with content to review and assignments to complete electronically. So Blackboard is one very good example of where you could provide content to your students. Students would then work through the materials and assignments at their own pace at the times that work for them throughout the week and then provide you with the work each week by a set deadline. You would provide feedback and encouragement and all of this would be done electronically in some way, ideally on Blackboard. So in this weekly pattern, everyone will move through the remaining weeks of the semester together. A fully online course also means that students need to connect with you and with other students using electronic means rather than in person. So such as email, online discussion boards, which we'll show today, posting announcements in Blackboard, or virtual conferencing tools like Blackboard Collaborate Ultra that we're using today. So taking some steps to connect with your students regularly, regularly throughout the remaining weeks of the course will go a long way building a sense of community in your classroom and helping students not feel alone in the online environment. Third, moving your course to fully online for this spring 2020 semester means continuing to be flexible, both with your students and with your expectations for yourself and for your course. So that flexibility can be a very important consideration in creating assignments and activities, which is what we'll be focusing on in today's webinar. So what, is fully, what fully online doesn't mean is that your class has to look or run a certain way. So we have templates that we can provide to help you. We're gonna demo examples in Blackboard, but there's no expectation that you use a certain piece of technology or that you put certain things into your course. Fully online also doesn't mean you're expected to become an expert in advanced technology or even an expert in Blackboard. We'll be showing you how to use some features of Blackboard, which is our online course platform, because we feel that can greatly benefit you and your students to get through this. But we don't expect you to become an expert in it or learn how to use every feature. Fully online doesn't mean that you have to give up on a meaningful learning experience. Not only can you and your students continue to work through your content and explore your discipline through assignments and activities, but working in the online environment can teach a great deal about perseverance, time management, creativity, and also all of us are learning how to be brave, try new things, be flexible, and being compassionate during this time. So really lots and lots of teachable moments during these weeks. So I mentioned compassionate, and that leads us into um, the next the next piece, which is a discussion on compassionate pedagogy. Um, we started talking about it in our last webinar, and I think it's extremely important as we think about what types of assignments and work we're gonna provide to our students. So as I mentioned, we uh, have Stephanie Whalen, who is the chair of the Academy, uh, to talk to us about compassionate pedagogy and how it's very important in the online environment. So I will turn it over to you, Steph. Thanks, Melissa. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, I okay, can. Good. 
Yeah, so some of you were in the webinar last time, and you remember we talked about some ideas for compassionate pedagogy and class assignments now that we're moving fully online. But as you can tell, some of these are relevant to any teaching and learning experience. So we've gathered some additional thoughts on that. First, it may be helpful to reframe the situation to see a positive aspect. So even though none of us were planning on this, we're all learning valuable skills that will serve us well going forward. We also want to think about providing equitable support. And this is not reducing rigor. It's actually just allowing for flexibility in how students get to the course goals. Sometimes it's OK to allow for additional time, additional attempts on an assignment or an exam, or alternate ways to engage with the content and demonstrate student learning. And this could be alternatives you offer for an entire class, or they could be individual on a student by student basis. We also want to think about reducing the pressure by allowing students to know and understand that due dates are meant to keep us all on track, but extensions can be possible, chances to redo and resubmit work can be possible, that this is most effective if you give students more feedback or provide them with additional learning resources before they redo or resubmit an assignment. We also want to think about continuing to acknowledge the reality of the situation and leveraging opportunities to connect course discussions to issues related to the COVID-19 crisis, and also think about connecting students to campus resources as needs come up. So we're not expecting you to be counselors or advisors, but there is an advisory page um, that has a, a phone number, if you're not sure who to connect them with, um, that can help point you in the right direction. There's also a form students can fill out uh, about their need, and that can help get them connected to the right uh, resources. We also want to make sure you're aware that there is now a no harm grading policy that academic standards has deemed appropriate for the pandemic. That information came out in an email from the provost's office from Maria Coons and outlines the flexible grading structure. So make sure you're aware of that and you know, um, interact with the provost's office if you have more questions about how that's going to work. But it's very clearly outlined. We also want to think about having creative solutions and offering alternate assignments. A lot of people are telling us they've been working with their department colleagues to come up with creative ways to um, demonstrate student learning, but students also have some ideas on how to adjust teaching and learning activities for this purpose. You also want to think about just providing different ways of having students demonstrate their learning in which you don't have to be concerned about proctoring exams or sharing answers. I know that's been a big concern for people. In some programs, we have to have proctored exams, but if you aren't required to do that, there might be other ways you could do that. When students can demonstrate their learning in a modality or platform that's meaningful to them, they can take more ownership. So for example, students recording themselves doing a problem or narrating or annotating their thought process might be a creative alternative to a multiple choice exam or traditional type exams that we've given. So think about those things a little bit and talk with your colleagues. We also want to go back to the whole transparency in learning and teaching framework and how that impacts student motivation. So this is important to, to keep students engaged. And also, some of the same language has come up when we've talked to Access and Disability Services about what are their concerns for students registered with them when it comes to being successful in the online environment. So a lot of overlap there. But first of all, it involves clarifying how you've designed the learning experience and why you designed it that way so that you can increase students' perceived value of why are we doing these activities. Also, their greater understanding of the learning process helps them um, generate what we call a positive outcome expectancy, that if they put in the effort, there's a likelihood that they'll have that positive outcome. And then explaining how their learning will be applicable to the course, their overall development, their career preparation can also help them to increase their engagement and motivation. So we take you back to that purpose task criteria. That's been something we've been weaving through a lot of our professional development this year um, that are the sort of tenets of the transparency and learning and teaching framework. So check your assignment instructions 
Four, purpose. Did you explain the learning experience you've designed for them? Have you given task um, instructions that are explicit so that they know what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to do it? And the smaller the step or the task, the, the easier it is for them to understand. But you also want to consider, especially in the online environment when you might not have as much communication, providing resources for students that you may view as supplemental resources, but they, they're really a great idea because you don't know who may need additional foundations or review of material in order to be able to successfully complete the assignments. And then for criteria, you know, clear expectations and models of how their work will be assessed. I think we all know we want to create rubrics, but perhaps we also want to show um, student exemplars of, you know, student work that meets the excellent criteria so that can help students as well. So we'll be getting into that more in later uh, webinars when we talk about um, giving meaningful feedback. And we also have an adjusted course syllabus that we shared last time. Um, this comes from UNC Chapel Hill. And as you can see, the faculty member labeled it adjusted syllabus and really acknowledged and validated what the students were going through. Also sort of justified why we need to be creative and adapt. And also highlighted some of the more positive aspects of resilience when we are encountering a situation like this. So those are some thoughts about compassionate pedagogy, and we'll continue to weave some of those through um, in our next few webinars as well. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I really appreciate it. Um, fabulous things to keep in mind as you move to the online environment where we can't see our students face to face. So a lot of these things like instruction and um, encouragement. We're going to provide them in text form or in audio form in an online environment. So it's just, it's great to, to think about these. Um, we're going to be moving on to um, the actual, like, well, here, I'll, I'll keep, we'll do a Q&A break in, in just a moment, but I'll, I'll get into this, this piece first. So thinking, piggybacking on what, what Stephanie described and what I was just talking about um, as far as the importance of providing all those great supports and instructions and things that you would give students in the face-to-face -face environment, moving them online, talk a little bit about assignment best practices. So really take a look, take an inventory of what's left in your course over these next five weeks or so. Um, and really think about what's reasonable, what um, gets the most kind of bang for the buck uh, to hit on the course objectives during the last five weeks. And think about what can students accomplish assignment-wise? What would you like to see from students each week? Uh, so really think of it in a, in a week layout. Um, and keep those, keep those thoughts of compassionate pedagogy in mind, like Stephanie said. Think about what, what is reasonable for you and the students. Think about possibly bringing in the global health crisis into one of the assignments, something the students could write and reflect on, things like that. Keep that tilt, that's the transparency framework, the um, purpose task criteria. Think about those things. That's a great guide as you write out instructions. Maybe in the past you've provided a handout with instructions for assignments or you verbally explained or written on the board assignment instructions to students in person. Write those, write those out. So write out the purpose of each assignment, the task, and the criteria, and I'll be showing you how you can put that into Blackboard um, to provide all of that guidance to students with each assignment that you that you give. Um, think about your when you're going to have students submit things to you. So think about due dates. And as Stephanie said, flexibility is great. If you can be lenient in some cases or consider extensions on due dates, you know, we're not requiring that that's what you do, but just keep it in mind during the situation. However, it's still good to set due dates, like Stephanie said, to keep to keep everyone moving forward, to give touch points for getting feedback and checking in. 
but think about your best working grading schedule as you set out due dates for assignments for the next five weeks. If there's days when this is a good time for me to be sitting and giving feedback in advance of an assignment being due as students have questions, and then a good time for me to grade work, think about your schedule as you set due dates for assignments. And then as much as possible, keep a rhythm over the next five weeks. Rhythm is really important in an online class because it's asynchronous. Students are checking in and out whenever works for them. So if they know when each week you're going to be posting the new material and assignments, when new assignments are going to be, or I'm sorry, where new assignments are going to be posted. So when they're going to show up, where they can find them in Blackboard, um, or via email or whatever. And then when assignments are due each week, if you can keep a consistent flow. So my goal is to post the next week's content by Friday evening, and you will find next week's content and assignments in X place in Blackboard. And then every week assignments are due, you know, Sunday at the end of the day at 11.59 p.m. By keeping a consistent rhythm over the next five weeks, that helps you get into a schedule, um, be compassionate on yourself about what's realistic, and it helps students know, okay, I know based on my childcare situation, based on my job, based on what's going on, I can set aside Thursdays to work on my this online class. And I know every week the assignments you know, from last week will have been posted, I can access these things. So keeping a rhythm is, is, is great uh, when you're setting up assignments. Uh, so we are going to move into, I'm going to pause for questions in, a, in just a second, um, but then we'll actually move into Blackboard and I'll be demonstrating uh, five different facets of things that you can think about as you move assignments uh, and activities online. So I'm going to be showing uh, discussion boards in Blackboard, be showing the assignment feature, uh, the assignment sort of Dropbox feature in Blackboard, a little bit about making tests and quizzes in Blackboard, some thoughts on presentations, on student presentations, if that's something that's a part of your course, and a couple of thoughts on incorporating group work into your class. So uh, I will be moving over to Blackboard and maneuvering around in there as we go through these, these different items. Uh, but before I do that, I, did, I wanted to pause, especially while Stephanie is here, and see if there were any questions on the content so far um, that anyone had in the, in the chat. Hi, Melissa. This is Janet. Hey, Janet. So there's there's been a number of Blackboard specific questions, but I, I think that you'll address some of those as you go through through Blackboard. But um, somebody did ask whether or not there is a specific syllabus shell that is available, you know, for right now with this this transition to online learning, or should they be, be using the syllabus template that we already have available through the Academy? So that's a great question. We don't have a specific updated syllabus shell because um, that will be pretty unique per class. If I would definitely encourage you to use the Harper College syllabus template that's available on harperacademy.net. Um, there's a syllabus button right up on the very top right of the, the site. And um, but I would I wouldn't necessarily transition into the syllabus template if you're not using it this semester. That would be for potentially future semesters. I would take whatever syllabus you're working on, save a new copy, and then wherever it makes sense, maybe in your schedule section of your syllabus, in your assignments and grading section, maybe, you know, flag it with a, you know, a bold heading and say, you know, this section's been updated for the, you know, remaining spring 2020, move to fully online. Um, so that the syllabus, except for those adjustments, still continues to look familiar to the students and familiar to you. Uh, so I would just adjust the the syllabus that you've been that you've been working in, rather than grabbing a, a new template. But if you do want to look at the Harper syllabus template, it is out on HarperAcademy.net. So great question. Okay, thanks, Melissa. And it looks like um, the syllabus template was the link was put into the chat. So oh, beautiful. That's good. Thank you. Yes. So beautiful. we're, we're good with that. Yeah. And I, I would just say that as you're going through assignments, um, you know, if there is any options that that you could 
could show that will allow students who may need more time and kind of yes. special accommodations um, to go ahead and show that because we've had a number of questions come up about that already. Absolutely, that's fabulous questions and I will demo that when we, um, when we get to the assignments part. So that'll be after the discussion boards and I will show exactly where you can adjust accommodations. Thank you, Janet, and thank you to those asking questions. Okay, I think as far as the rest of the questions, we could address those within the chat. So, so okay. go ahead, keep going. All right, All right. Um, so we, I am going to, um, oh, so before I pop into Blackboard, I just want to know, once I move into Blackboard and I'm moving around, things can potentially get a little overwhelming. <laughs> and, you know, you can be like, oh, well, she's clicking there, she's doing this. Um, we have a lot of detailed how to written documents. We have how to videos. Uh, we also have our essential online skills webinar series that we did before we left campus back in March that goes through in more detail. So please go to harperacademy.net and you can go to uh, resources and support and get all kinds of um, planning for rapid transition to online instructions on various topics. So just know that there's lots of other Blackboard uh, support available to you. Um, I'm also going to show the second blue arrow that's kind of down to the right is pointing at our online instruction support form. I will be showing you a folder structure template uh, that is available to you to be put in your Blackboard course. Many of you have that already. Um, it's not required, but it is something that you can request using this online instruction support form. There is also a summer 2020 full online course template that you can request if you have an empty summer 2020 shell that you're kind of eyeing down, <laughs> eyeing up right now. Um, and this online instruction support form is also available for specific questions on Blackboard, questions on going into you know, any of these topics. So please utilize that. All right, so we are going to, I'm going to stop sharing this um, PowerPoint. And I am going to share my screen with you so that I can show you Blackboard. This is something you can do in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. You can create that funky rabbit hole. Don't worry, there's nothing, nothing wrong with your screen. <laughs> so I'm just sharing my full screen. So it kind of goes into a little rabbit hole for a second. So I am in, um, I am in a Blackboard shell, and I would like to show you. Um, the, we have a folder structure that you can have copied into your course if using that online instruction support form I showed you on the Harper site. Many of you have requested this already, um, but basically what we've set up for you is um, a week by week structure. Um, many of the weeks have passed already, so we're in this April 6th through 12th time frame. Just an organized week-by-week -week place where you can put content for students and put assignment links and, and assignment information for students. So we are going to be digging in today to this April 13th through 19th week and showing, we showed how to build content last week and this week we're gonna show how to build assignments. Now inside each week, we have a place for you to provide an overview for that week. So what are the learning objectives you will cover? What are the activities that you would like students to participate in? And then this is what we're focusing on this week. What assignments would you like students to um, engage with during the week and submit to you? So inside the, well, I'll pop into the activities quickly. So inside the activities, this is where you would provide reading and viewing, provide any lecture materials, other content that you want the students to, um, to engage with. And this is going to be our focus this week. The second part, after they've taken a look at content, we're suggesting having some uh, assignments students can engage with. So we are gonna be showing a discussion board. We're gonna show how to make an assignment link. We're gonna show how to make uh, a quiz for students and provide a couple of other options. So these are just prompts in here. These aren't active things. These are just, the, here's some things for you to keep in mind. Uh, so if you do ask for this folder structure, you will get one of these, um, one of these 
folders for each week of the rest of the course. So as I showed here, um, we've got this week or this, this coming week, and then we've got folders to take you out through the rest of the semester. So your goal for building, uh, try, you know, just make a goal of doing one week at a time. So if you can get April 13th through 19th built out this week and available to students, that's fabulous. Then, you know, work, work on the next week, you know, as you can. Try to get into that rhythm for yourself and the students of when you build out different things. So again, you can request this folder structure to be put into your course. It's not mandatory. If you already have places in your course where you're providing things to students or where you'd like to provide things, that, that's great. I'm gonna um, model creating some assignments in this folder structure. So I made another copy of the folder structure in this demo area. Um, uh, so I'm gonna model in the folder structure, but you may be putting things in a different place. So let's talk about um, discussion boards. So I am going to go into my April 13th and 19th week. And we worked on this. If you were in the part one webinar series uh, um, or are thinking about watching that part one webinar series, you will see we set up, you know, our topics we're going to cover for the week and our activities for the week. And we built out a message to students saying, this is what our goals are for the week. This is what you're going to be doing. We showed how to add a link to an article, how to put a video in for students, and then how to provide a PowerPoint lecture um, and some uh, mini lecture recordings from Collaborate Ultra and things like that. So this, is, this was all created in the part one, uh, providing content to students. So now, and our content was all on tempering chocolate. So we had students watch videos on tempering chocolate. We had them read articles on it. And now we're going to build out this assignments piece in this part two webinar. So we are going to build a discussion board. We're going to build an assignment and we're going to build a short quiz. So I'm actually going to delete these prompts. These are just prompts. They're not just to say like, these are some things you should include. So with anything in Blackboard, you've got this little gray options button and one of the options is to delete. So I'm gonna go through and delete all of these prompts here so that this assignments folder for the week is cleared out. And so we are first going to build a discussion board. So before I build, I'll talk a little bit about discussion boards. So discussion boards can be a great tool during this, especially during this time when you're just looking for places for you and the students to connect with each other. So discussion boards can help provide an asynchronous place uh, for in-class discussion, debate, um, even a place to submit work so students can see one another's, another's work, things like that. You can have a discussion board for a whole class. Or you can assign, you can make discussion boards and say, okay, just these students post here, just these students post here. So you can have smaller groups participate in discussions. You can also build a discussion board that's not a graded assignment. It can be a open forum for students to just, just chat. It can also be a great place for them to ask you questions. So it can serve as a Q&A space so that you don't have to keep sending the same emails over and over with the same responses to questions. Um, when you're implementing discussion boards, uh, provide, if it's going to be a graded discussion board or an alternative to true in-class discussion, really think about some quality prompts for students. Uh, nothing that's just like a yes, no. Asking them to relate content to their lives, relate to their careers. You might even want to give students choices. Give them a couple of different questions and let them choose which one interests them the most. Provide that clear expectation. That's that transparency. Provide criteria for student responses. What do you expect for the students um, when they're posting to the discussion boards? And even very effective to get your expectations across, consider providing a model post. Um, so if you want to provide a, a, a post on 
the identical prompts or even a slightly different prompt to model what a good discussion post might look like. And then uh, the last tip here is get in there, uh, especially for the, the first time you, you make a discussion board. Don't be afraid to go in and reply to some students. If they see you in the discussion board, especially that first one, they're going to be much more apt to say, oh, the, the instructor's in here. They're just reading what I posted. So don't be afraid to reply give praise publicly in the discussion board if there's if there's good um good posts and provide you know help continue the discussion along so just some thoughts on discussion boards so let's 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 build one so discussion boards in blackboard they live in the discussion board discussion boards have a very unique set of like rules and things that blackboard needs to, to have so they kind of there's its own little discussion board area in blackboard and when you click into your discussion board area you can create a new forum so a forum is going to be a specific topic of discussion so you can click create forum and it's going to give you a place to give your forum a name provide a description and all of that now, I have already clicked on Create Forum and made a forum here for our April 13th through 19th week on Tempering Chocolate, but I'll show you a little bit about what I did, and I can go back into the forum by clicking, there's that little gray arrow in Blackboard, um, and it gives me an option to edit it. So I'll go in and edit this forum and just show you what I put into it when I created it. So I gave it a title. So I, I gave the dates in this case, the fact that it's a discussion board and um, it's on tempering chocolate. In my description, I gave student, now I was very explicit. I said purpose, task, criteria. You may just want to you know, write these out without highlighting it. But you know, I said, you know, chocolate is meant to be shared. Let's really talk about this topic. I gave some options. They can select two of the following. They can talk about one thing that they learned that they explained to a family member or friend this week, one question that they still have about this week's material, or and or one resource they'd recommend to fellow students that address the topic. Um, I gave the, the task is also once you've posted one thread, reply to at least two of your classmates. So I gave some criteria. They should address the students' questions, provide additional information not just say, I agree, or thanks for posting, expand on the conversation. I also added for one extra credit point, attach a photograph that shows you engaging with the material. Um, I gave a clear deadline, so the end of the day Thursday to post their first post, and the response posts are due by the end of the day Sunday. So having that kind of, um, setting up those expectations is very helpful. So I put all of that in the description. Um, I, down here, I clicked on grading the discussion forum. This discussion is gonna be worth points for the students. So I have typed in 20 points possible. I gave it the due date that I said. So I said it was gonna be due, the whole discussion board was gonna be due the 19th at 1159 p.m. So I entered that. And then I clicked on, um, I like to allow authors to delete their own posts and allow authors to edit their own posts. So I checked those and I left everything else there. So once I've created this forum, it lives here in the discussion boards area. So students can come to the discussion board link in your Blackboard shell. And if you have the discussion board link and you've had it hidden, you can also, you can, um, make the link active again if you're starting to use discussion boards but you may already have this link available um, so they can come here and click in the discussion board and post but you can also post an access point to that discussion board right in your week so i am going to show that and actually to do that i'm going to go back to my discussion board got to do one thing i'm going to go back in and edit when I make the link, it's going to ask me to provide a description. So I like to just copy the same description from the, um, from the discussion board itself when I make the link. And you'll see, you'll see what I do when I get there. So if I go into my weekly modules 
and I'm going to go to my April 13th through 19th and this is going to be an assignment for the week. So here I'm going to start making my assignments and I want a discussion board access point here so they can click right here and start talking with one another. So to make a discussion board access point, we're going to click on tools and then we are going to link to a discussion board. So I am going to select a specific forum. So that's a specific topic that I made. And any of your forums that you've made in the discussion boards area will be listed here. So I want an access point to this April 13th through 19th discussion board. I can select that and click next. It's going to automatically populate that topic. I like to number my assignments, so I'm going to add a number one. It'll show it as the first assignment for the week. And then here, I can paste that uh, description from the discussion board itself. And then, since this is just an access point to that discussion board, that's really all I have to do. So I'll click Submit. And now, here in my assignments, it says Success. Uh, here in my assignments, I have an access point for the discussion board. So students can access the discussion by going to the list of all your boards or inside my assignments for the week, I have an access point for them. So um, how students engage with the discussion board. Uh, I wanted to show, um, I'm going to go in and post as a student in a second, but I wanted to demo one thing that was mentioned as the um, something to consider when doing discussion boards is think about making a model post. So ooh, I kind of got ahead of myself. I went inside the discussion board. So I went into my forum here. I'm in the discussion board. And notice nobody has posted yet. So it looks <laughs> kind of looks a little scary when there's nothing in there yet. But there's this create thread. And that is how you can post a message and start getting replies and things like that. As a faculty member, it's kind of nice not to have students see this scary kind of empty thing when they go into a discussion board. So I'm going to create a model thread here by clicking on Create Thread. And as a faculty member, I can say, I'm still learning about you know, tempering chocolate. So um, I am always finding new resources. Um, one question I still have, da, da, da. So you can look at your um, instructions and consider providing a model post to your students. So I'm gonna submit that model post. And now there's a post from me as the instructor in the discussion board. Now, as a student, I can show you what it looks like for the student. It looks very similar to the instructor. But if you haven't used this student preview in your Blackboard course, highly recommend that you give this a try. So entering student preview will show your course from the student's perspectives. And you can actually go in as a student and take your own assignments, take tests, like try things out. So I'm going to enter the student preview by clicking on that button in the upper right. And I am going to, um, I could access the discussion board here, but I'll also show how if I am in our April 19th week and I'm in assignments, I know the first assignment is I need to participate in this discussion board. So I can click in here. And this is where it's nice. I can see that my instructor posted a topic already. I can create a new thread. Um, and then I can provide my response as a student. Note that students or you can also attach things to discussion boards. This could be a great place for students to share example work with each other and things like that. And then I can submit. So now this is me as a student. It shows up as preview user. So now we've got a couple of discussion topics, the instructor and a student. So students or you can go into any threads and this blue reply button will show up and you can respond to students and students can respond to each other. You can respond. All right. 
So I'm going to exit the student preview now. And I'm going to show you as a faculty member where you can grade students discussion boards. And there will be a whole set, uh, webinar on grading and feedback next time, but I'll just give you a sneak peek so you can see this for now. But if I go into the full grade center, here I am as that preview user. That was when I went as, as a student. You'll get this, um, when you create a graded discussion board, it automatically makes this column in the grade book. And these little green exclamation points will show up when it's time to grade or when students have submitted something um, for grading. So you can click here and grade user activity and you can actually see all of the posts. It collects all the posts for that particular user. You can take a look and you can provide grades. So a discussion board absolutely can be used as a graded experience for students to help them really engage with the material. All right, so I'm going to pause for a second before we move on to assignments. So that was just a little taste of discussion boards. Are there any questions that are coming in that you'd like me to address now on discussion boards? Hi, Melissa. It's Janet hey, here. Janet. Hey, Janet. So a question, a question came up. Can students then copy the responses from other students in discussion boards? Um, yes. So you can, um, you can physically copy and paste, but there is a quote option and it will quote the other so instead of just clicking reply it will you know particularly it will copy that um the post from the prior one so that you're able to you know note on it or or mark on it so you can quote from um other students using that quote method instead of just the straight reply Okay, and then this is just a clarification. If we're using the discussion board as a Q&A, do you recommend it as a weekly forum or how often should they be doing discussion boards? Okay, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, so when, when I taught online classes, I really liked having a Q&A per week. Um, so that I knew, so in, in each week, uh, I would say, um, like, you, you know, you might even hover a, a discussion board right there. So you would add a discussion board here that says like weeks or um, April 13th through 19th Q and A, you know, put questions for this week's topic in this discussion board. That helped kind of organize the questions. However, that was my preference to do one Q&A per week. Um, you can also simply do one Q&A discussion board for the course, but you can post a link to that same Q&A discussion board in each week. So let's say I created a forum. Uh, so I went back to discussion boards. Remember, we create our discussion boards in that area and I put class Q&A, you know, and then I wouldn't put grading, I'd leave it as no grading. Um, I still like to allow authors to delete and edit posts, that's my preference, um, and submit. So now I've got this class Q&A discussion board here. And if I go to my learning modules, um, you could, I mean, you could put the discussion board sort of hovering here, or you could tell people like just go to the discussion board for this one because we're going to use it every week. Um, but what I would probably like to do is every single week, just so they remember, I would build that link to the discussion board using tools discussion board and I would grab my class Q&A discussion board and, you know, post a description there like please put your questions here, help other students if you know the answers. And so then you've got that class Q&A discussion board linked 
every week. So you can just continue using that class Q&A throughout. Like I said, I like to make a new one for each week because the topics would change, but it's really preference. Making one for each for the whole class would be a lot easier. Um, but there's no there's no right or wrong. It's really kind of what makes sense for you and your students. And while we're talking about q and A, I'm so glad someone asked this question. <laughs> um, a great thing for you as a faculty to do uh, and students as well is when you click inside a discussion forum, there is a subscribe button. And if you click on that, if you subscribe to a forum, you will get an email anytime someone posts to that forum. So you don't have to keep going into Blackboard to see if anyone's posted. You can check your email and say, oh, someone posted to the Q&A in this class. Then you can come into Blackboard and address it. Um, so subscriptions, um, that's a great way. So again, that's where you go into any forum. So I've already subscribed to the class Q&A, but if I wanted to subscribe to this week's assignment discussion board, I go into the forum and there's that subscribe button hovering, you know, on the main sort of part of the, the board. So great question. Melissa, can you review again, when you're creating a discussion board, if uh, to set that option so that students have to reply before they see the other answers in a discussion. Oh, board. sure, sure. Okay, so there is an option. Um, let me go to. I can. Uh, I can edit this one. So if you want a student to not see other students' posts and post um, have to post first before they're able to see others, so that. Um, if there's going to be maybe a question where there is maybe a right or wrong answer or you just want students to think of their own answer before they see someone else's. When you create a forum or I'm going to edit this forum, one of the options down here is to do, do, do. Where is it? There we go. Way up on the top. Participants must create a thread in order to view other threads in this forum. So, um, oh, and then it takes off some of the edit and delete own posts. That's fine. So it just says like you can't take away a post because we're going to make you, you know, so it removes some of the other options. Um, but that that's okay. So right up here, the viewing threads replies, participants must create a thread in order to view other threads. So that is definitely an option, especially for a graded forum. Once they make a post, all the other posts and replies from the class would be seen. Good question. Okay, Melissa, I think we're good. The rest of the questions we're answering in the chat. Okay, all right. So um, I'd like to move on from discussion boards to assignments. So assignments are essentially like a Dropbox point in Blackboard for students to submit work to you. So they allow attachments. Uh, students can submit papers. They can submit links to you for things. So it really provides you with a great alternative to a lot of emails going back and forth. It lets you and the students better keep track and um, have a more uh, safer and more organized place to access assignments. It also gives you built-in grading and feedback capabilities. So um, it lets you more easily grade students' work and it provides an access point for you to reach out to students and provide that connection with them while getting through the assignment work. Um, so some tips for building assignments during this flexible time. There is an option to allow students to submit assignments more than once if they have any difficulties, so I'll show you that. Um, as you're building assignments, whenever possible, provide examples. That's part of that transparency. So provide um, model work, provide examples from past classes, things like that. Um, if you have a rubric that you use for grading or if you have grading criteria that you use, consider providing that as part of the assignment. So that can be a great tool as students work on that paper, work on that particular assignment. And um, 
utilize the grading feature in Blackboard. Even if you haven't used assignments in Blackboard before or used the book, um, give it a try for uh, for an assignment and let, you know, you can let the students know we're, we're trying this out. Um, but this is a great, this is a great place to, to connect with students and give feedback. So I'm going to show you, keep clicking on the wrong thing there. We are going to build an assignment in our demo class. So if I go into my week here, into my assignments, I've got that discussion board, but now I also want students to submit. One of the things we added in the content area in the last webinar was with the lecture, they got a short questionnaire called a lecture guide, and they had to answer some questions and submit them to me this week to show that they understood the, the lecture and gone through the content. So I wanna build an assignment point here for them to submit those lecture guides to me. So to create an assignment, I'm going to click on assessments, select assignment. And we're going to give the assignment a name. So I'm going to call this, I've got a name sort of prepped in advance. I'm going to call this um, number two. It's the second assignment of the week after the discussion board. This is an assignment, submit the completed lecture guide. I'm going to provide a description and instructions for completing the assignment. I'm going to use that purpose task criteria, excellent for an online course. Um, to say, you know, you're going to have a completed lecture guide. It's going to give you practice. Um, download the lecture guide above, respond to the questions and attach it in the assignment drop box. Um, looking for a few thoughtful sentences under each prompt. Bonus if you ask me some questions and then I give a clear due date. So you can attach instructions as well. This might not be if you have detailed instructions such as for a major paper or a major project, you may not want to type everything here, but you can attach any files or instructions that go with that assignment. So even though I attached the lecture guide back in the content area last week, I'm going to attach the blank lecture guide again here so students have another easy access point. I said that this was going to be due Sunday at the end of the day, April 19th. And this is going to be a 30, oops, I'll have this be a 30 point assignment. So you can give points possible. Um, one thing that I'd like you to consider during this time is under the submission details as you're setting up an assignment, there it defaults to a single attempt for an assignment. Um, but I'd like to offer, I'm going to switch this to unlimited attempts. That just means if someone submits the wrong lecture guide or something goes wrong with their assignment, they can come and submit it again. It's not a problem. Um, and that can really help any, any time you're working with assignments. And then I will click Submit. So I have now made an assignment access point here in Blackboard using that assessments assignment. And I'm going to go in as a student and I'll show you, I'm going to use that student preview button again, and I'll show you what this looks like from the student perspective. So if I click into my April 13th through 19th week as a student, I click into my module assignments, I'm going to do my discussion board post, and then, oh, it's time for me to complete my lecture guide. I can click here to download the lecture guide. I can read my instructor's instructions and to submit i click on this link here it reminds me again of the instructions as well as how many points this assignment is worth and it gives me a point in this assignment submission area where i can attach files i can attach one or more files um, to submit to to the instructor so i have completed a Basinger version of the lecture guide with some responses, and I can submit that here to the instructor. I could add comments if I want to and click Submit. So as a student, I can see um, what I submitted to the instructor. I didn't do too much here. I just wrote a couple of sentences. Um, and if something went wrong, I could start a new assignment because my instructor activated that 
unlimited attempts, so I could submit again. But if I'm all set here, I can click OK. So as a student, I submitted the assignment there. So I've gone back in as an instructor by clicking off that student preview. And as an instructor, when I created that assignment, it created another gradebook column. Here's my assignment, submit your completed lecture guide. So Melissa, the student user, she's participated in the discussion board I see, and now I can see here that there is an assignment um, that's been submitted as well. And as an instructor, if I want to grade this, I can click the attempt, and I can see the student work. So students should submit work to you using Word documents or PDF works well. Um, pages, which is like the Apple, the Mac version of Word, that won't work. So if you open a student's work and you see like can't load or whatever, just let them know again, please attach it in a Word or PDF. You can actually see their work right here and you can make comments to students on specific points in the within oops, post, comments within the assignment itself which gets saved for the student to see you can also over here on the right this is where you can give a score and you can provide overall feedback on the on the assignment providing comments and feedback this is a great way to connect with students. Even if you can't spend a lot of time in discussion boards, think, you know, just providing some feedback to students is great. And there's going to be a whole webinar on Thursday about feedback in the gradebook. So you'll get to see a lot more of these types of features. But I just wanted to show you this process for now. So I'm submitting my grade to the student. So they have a 25. And um, I will show you the, the grade center, how the student sees that assignment in a little bit, but I want to move on into um, tests next. So we talked about assignment. Any questions on assignments before we move into the, the tests and quizzes area? Hi, Melissa. So there was a question um, that came up that if a student emails an instructor an assignment, is there a way that you know of um, to get that assignment that they emailed uploaded into Blackboard? Um, I'll, I'll say what's come, what comes to my mind, and then if, if you or Karen want to, to chime in. What I would do if a student emailed me something, one, you can say, you know, please go to Blackboard, you know, let them know that you've made an assignment link and if they can go to Blackboard and submit that to you. So give them that option, let them know where to find it in the class. You know, that might not have been the normal procedures thus far, but you're, you know, trying to move forward. So give them the opportunities to submit that. If that's not a possibility, you can come to that student. So let's see, here's Mike Bates, and he's emailed me his assignment rather than posting it here. So I don't see the little exclamation point. Um, I can go in and uh, let me see. Can I view grade details? Um, I can manually override a grade. I can still give him a grade here as, you know, reviewing it. I can give him feedback here. You know, I received your assignment via email. Um, you can adjust the, um, you can, you know, take that assignment, make comments inside whatever document he provided, and then you can actually attach, um, you know, attach your, you know, if they sent you the assignment and you've provided comments, you can attach that with your feedback. So now with your feedback, you have their graded submission with, you know, with any comments on that and then any overall comments that you want to provide to the student. So then you could save that. So if I look in the grade center, now Mike has a 25 on here and I can see, you know, if I go back to the grade details, 
I can see, you know, I gave them a 25. So it's that manual override area where, you, you know, it doesn't automatically give you the window, but you can give feedback and attach things there. So that could be a way to kind of get work around that. As far as I know, there isn't a way for you to be that student and put an assignment in there. So if you can guide them to submitting the assignment, that um, that would be best. Ooh, I gotta get out of here. So hopefully, I would. Um, I know that's a little more complicated, you know, perhaps than for the for the short period of time. So feel free to ask, you know, submit. Uh, Instruct, uh, support form request or whatever if you've got a situation with a student in assignments and you need some help. Okay, thanks, Melissa. And mm -hmm. can you can you demonstrate one more time just how to actually get to the point of where you create an assignment? So we've had a few people who say they do it all in course materials. Can they create an assignment in course materials? Maybe they're doing it in learning modules. So maybe just just kind of get sure. to where you start and, and walk to that step again. Yeah. So that's a great question because you can make an assignment point anywhere in Blackboard, any content area. So if you have a learning modules area, if you're using this folder, if you've got a course materials area, you may have a link that just says assignments. As long as you can see these menus when you, so I went into this course materials area here. Um, and when you, anywhere you can build content assessments, tools, you click on that assessments option. And then assignment is one of the options. And you are telling Blackboard here in course materials, I wish to place an assignment point, an assignment link. So then if I click here, you know, then I can say, you know, assignment. I can, this is, again, I can um, attach any instructions, give my points give a due date, all of that stuff. And when I submit it, there will be an assignment link right here inside my course materials that will um, be, you know, be exactly the same, serve, have all the same functionality as if you made an assignment point in learning modules. So it's that assessments assignment button in Blackboard where you can make an assignment access point. Okay, um, another question, if you know this one, is there a place that you can download all the assignments at one time, like if they're in a PDF format or Word format? And if, if you don't know the answer to that, we could, we could address that in the chat. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> so Janet, maybe you or Karen know that one. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll pass on that one. <laughs> Okay, well, that's fine. Um, okay. And then somebody did ask if it's okay after the assignment deadline, if students that didn't participate, is it, is it okay to allow more time for them to submit the assignment? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a great idea to give due dates to keep people, you know, to keep the class moving, have touch points, but especially in this scenario, um, when you make a due date on an assignment, it doesn't close that assignment, drop that assignment box. Um, that will simply flag, you know, it'll simply let everyone know this. It'll put it on the calendar in Blackboard and things like that. Um, but students, as long as you keep the link open, students can still submit assignments even past the due date. And so then it's up to you if you are, you know, docking points or anything like that. The process for grading and giving feedback on assignments and everything I showed is still the same. Um, it's just up to you if you want to, you know, make any comments to them or add anything about being late, but they still can absolutely submit after a, after a due date. Okay. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, you yep. can continue on. All right. So the last, um, the item, last item we'll show in detail is how to add a short quiz. Um, so just a little some thoughts about tests and quizzes. So, well, during this time, we know that graded tests and exams will be, um, can be a difficult challenge to think about. Um, what we're gonna show today in the assignments part is if you think about using the test function in Blackboard, 
short quizzes can actually be a great knowledge check opportunity for students. And they can provide you and the students with really quick feedback if you use things like multiple choice questions and other things that Blackboard can automatically grade. You can also go into your grade center after students have completed a quiz um, or a test, and you can actually look at an analysis of that test and see you know, which questions students are getting right or wrong. So implementing short quizzes can be a great alternative to major exams uh, in a class and give you and the students a little check-in point. Um, and just some tips, if this is your first time and the student's first time you know, making tests and quizzes in Blackboard, make the first one really low stakes. You know, maybe you know, have one that's worth very little points or no points um, or just ask some you know, easy questions. Um, think about the test options that are available to you and the students. So one of the great questions was about accommodation, so I'm going to show that. Um, and then also thinking about tests and quizzes as a whole, we're still encouraging for major exams, think about if you're, you know, if you're going to struggle with providing major graded uh, you know, finals exams for the students, think about some alternate test options. Uh, such as papers, presentations, uh, things like that that students can be doing instead of exams uh, during this time if, you know, having students being at home to take the exams is, is an issue. Um, so we are, um, as we get closer to finals time, we will continue to provide additional resources and materials on testing in Blackboard, but for today I want to show um, just how to uh, implement a basic quiz in Blackboard and how you can look at the results. Oh, I keep, <laughs> keep clicking on my session. You can see the rabbit hole every time. Um, so to build a um, test or quiz in Blackboard, any set of graded questions, you're going to start in your course tools area. And there you have a test surveys and pools sort of place. And this is where your tests are born. <laughs> this is where you can build your tests, set up questions and points. So um, you can click on build test, give your test a name, and add questions. So for our time today, I've already built my test here. Um, but I'm going to show you by clicking edit. So I gave my test a name. I called it. It's the third assignment for the week. It's a quiz, a knowledge check on tempering chocolate. I created two questions by clicking on create question and I added two multiple choice questions. So just a couple of quick checks on um, uh, their knowledge of tempering chocolate. So here inside this test creation area, remember I'm under course tools, I'm under test surveys and pool in the test itself. This is also where I can designate points per question. So I made each of my questions worth five points. So that's your first step is to actually build your test here. There are a ton of test options in Blackboard. You can make tests where it pulls questions randomly from a pool, all those types of things. We're not going to go into advanced testing, but that is something you can request help on. And we also have lots of great resources, how-to videos, how to do all those things on our harperacademy.net. So I have built the test, but now, kind of like the discussion board, I built a discussion board, launched it you know, somewhere for the students. Um, I can launch my test, because right now the students can't see it. I've built it in the test area. But in my April 13th through 19th week in the assignments, the third thing I want them to do is take the little knowledge check. So I am going to um, actually launch a test here, make sort of a test access point uh, here in this area. So to do that, I'm going to click on assessments. And this was where we added the assignments. Another option for assessments is test. So if I click on test, it is going to say, oh, you want to you know, place a test here. Which one would you like to place? And there's a test that I built in my test surveys and pools area, that quiz. And click Submit. And it will automatically populate the access point with the name of your test, but you could change that if needed. 
You can give your in students some instructions on the test. So I've saved some here. Click on the link above, click begin. We'll take a little mini quiz. You'll have 30 minutes to take the quiz. You'll have three attempts to take the quiz and your highest score will be kept. So I'll show you how to set up those options as well as set up accommodations for a student that maybe needs time and a half, like needs 45 minutes to take the quiz. Um, set a due date for the quiz. And then here, it's at this launch point where you get all of these different options for how students will be interacting with those. For me, it was just those two questions that I created. So I want the link to become available to students right away. I can also send out an announcement in Blackboard when the test becomes available. So students are waiting. If you're gonna be you know, making a test available at a certain point, you might want an announcement. This is just a quiz, so I'm not gonna worry about that. I said that I was going to allow multiple attempts. I was going to let students take the test three times. Oops. What did I do? All right. Sorry about that. Let me go back in and edit the test options. That's what I'm working on right now. All right. You get my, I don't know what I did there. Put my description back in there. What did I do? All right, I'm going to delete this one and do it again. Okay. So assessments and test. We get extra, <laughs> extra um, walkthrough of this. I'm going to select that test. All right, try this a third time. There we go. Instructions make the link available. I was in the middle of doing multiple attempts. Three attempts on this quiz. I will take the highest grade so you can choose what grade will be kept. I want the students to complete the test in one sitting. They can't come back to it. And I said that they had 30 minutes to take the test. So all of these are options that you can choose. You can also set a time for the test to disappear if you don't want students to be accessing a test after a certain time period because perhaps you're going to be sharing answers or feedback. So I said April 19th at the end of the day. Um, so you might want to set it, the test to disappear at that time. It's up to you. Right here under this test availability exceptions, this is where you can add accommodations for students that may need them. So I can, the first thing you're gonna do is say, well, what users need the accommodations? You click on add user, you will see a list of everyone in your class. So I'm gonna select Mike Bates as a, a student that needs an accommodation. And you can adjust how many attempts, maybe they get more attempts, maybe they get more time. So if Mike needs 45 minutes, I can adjust that for Mike. And maybe I, Mike gets to be able to come back to the test at different times. He doesn't have to complete the attempts in one shot. And I can add additional. So if Karen needs, um, she gets unlimited attempts rather than three. So you can adjust the accommodations here under this test availability exceptions. Can set a due date for the test. So I said it was going to be due end of day on the 19th and you can decide when students if ever get to see the answers so after submission they're just going to see their score per question that's the default and that's fine you may say I don't care if they see all of the correct answers you can you can choose what they get to see um, so maybe after submission they just get to see their score but maybe after the due date they get to see all of the answer you know so you can decide when you want things to become available to students you can also decide if they see the test all at once or if they see one question at a time okay so i've submitted here and um here is the the quiz so now there is an access point to this quiz that two multiple choice questions um, so I'm going to go in and take it as a student. So 
So as a student, I can see this quiz here. When I click here and begin, I've chosen to let the student see all the questions at once. I can submit my answers. Are you sure? Yes. And I can see that, or it says click OK to review results. So I can see that I got five out of five points on the first one and zero out of five on the second one. On the second question, my instructor said all I could see was scores. I can't see correct answers until after the due date. So I can click OK. Now, because I have multiple attempts, I can actually begin again. It says you've completed the test already, um, but you can say I'd like to start a new submission. So if you've given them multiple attempts, they can do that. I'll try this again. And I think I did worse on this one. Yeah, I didn't get any points, but the students can can go through that process. I'm going to exit the preview. So the last thing that I'll show about tests, and I know we went over this very quickly, like I said, well, there's a lot more resources available. Um, but I'll show you from the faculty standpoint, again, Grade Center, full Grade Center, as we make these graded assignments, these columns get created. So there's our discussion board, there's our assignment. Melissa, the me as a student, has taken the test, and my highest grade is shown in the grade book in the grade book. I got five out of ten points on that first attempt, zero out of ten on the second attempt. There is my highest score as of now. So this can be a great way for students to do quick knowledge checks. Now, if I want to, I mentioned that you can use tests to do an analysis of um, the class as a whole. If you have a test that you've launched in Blackboard, if you click, I'm in the Grade Center here, if you click here, there is a attempts statistics. So it doesn't necessarily jump out of it, but if you think of statistics, I need the, you know, the stats on this test. If I click on it, you can see how many students answered each one correctly and incorrectly, and you can get a lot of um, class data on tests. So this can help you um, take kind of a, a, a test of where the class is at a, a given point. So that was kind of a, a quick run through on um, tests, and I can see we're nearing the, the time on the end of our session. So. Um, I will take if there's a couple of probably can't answer a lot of questions on tests in a couple of minutes. So actually, I'll come back to the final Q&A for those that want us to stay. I did want to talk a little bit about presentations and group work in Blackboard, and then I'll stay on to answer questions for anyone that that want, that's interested. Um, so you can absolutely still have students do presentations. They can be in the online environment. Um, fantastic for all the great reasons you would do presentations in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, some great tips for implementing is give students options now that you're in the online environment. Um, do you want them to record a presentation in advance and provide that to you? Do you want to make a one-on-one -on -one collaborate session where they present to you individually? Do you want to have them present to the class as a whole and collaborate or WebEx? Um, give students some different options. Uh, if possible, provide examples of presentations. So uh, if you can record yourself giving a presentation or have any examples of past work, that can really help. Providing a rubric or grading criteria in advance can be very helpful as well. And like I said, giving the option for students to record and share. Um, they can share as a link to you in an assignment, or you could make it a graded discussion board, and they can see one another's submissions. Um, you will see, if you access these slides on um, harperacademy.net, um, I wasn't going to show the full video today, but if you if you want to see it, you, you can see it. Um, this is a wonderful example of a presentation as an alternate assignment. Kissa Jaffrey is a student of Veronica Mormino's Honors Hume 115 Afro-Cuban Geography, History, and Culture. They were um, scheduled to go to Cuba over spring break for um, a study abroad experience, but that was canceled. So talk about alternative assignments. So Veronica had her students 
create recorded presentations of an aspect of Cuban culture, history, or geography that interested them. And Kissa, in her own kitchen, recorded a fantastic presentation making Cuban chicken and black beans and tying the cuisine to, to Cuba's history. So this was just, she, at the end of the video, she says, we can't go to Cuba, but we can bring Cuba to our plates. And so it was just an amazing, using this presentation, um, Veronica, uh, she gave students the options to um, record their presentations and either put them up to YouTube or give them to Veronica to put up to YouTube. Um, so uh, Kissa put this up to YouTube her, herself. Um, and they and Veronica shared with the other students in the class that kind of share their presentations through a discussion board. So just a great way to connect with with students um, that way. You still can do group work or even add group work if you don't use it in your class. Um, even if you don't have a large group project, even having students get in groups for small discussions or for like low stakes assignments can be a great way to um, build that sense of community. So if, or if you already have group work going in your classes, you can continue that in the online environment. Just understand that students may need additional time, additional flexibility to keep moving on group projects. Um, so you may want to consider group work as an, let students have a choice if they want to work in groups or make groups you know, part of a low stakes activity. Um, to provide students spaces to work for group work, you can provide a discussion forum for each group to work in in the discussion boards area and have them go into their group's discussion board and work there. You can also provide a um, unique Blackboard Collaborate um, session that you share with each group. So um, that, if I'm in Blackboard, Collaborate Ultra, that is under my course tools, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, and this you can submit a request to be happy to help you with this. You can create individual sessions, so I made an example here. Um, you can create a session for each group, and then you can share the link to that session uh, just with the students in that group. So you can email just group one and say, use this room, email group two. That gives them a space to go in and chat and share things if you're having them work on things, just as another option to discussion boards. All right, so sorry to rush those last two things at the end. There wasn't anything too technical in Blackboard I was gonna show, but I did wanna just mention that this is a possibility even in the online environment to continue presentations and group work. All right, so I didn't mean to, to fly past the test Q&A part. I just wanted to make sure that we, I covered some of the content by our 11.30 session. So I'll take uh, um, questions. For those of you that have to sign off at 11.30, thank you so much for attending. Um, just a reminder that um, all kinds of resources and support on Blackboard and Blackboard Collaborate Ultra is available at harperacademy.net. Um, you can submit a request to have that folder structure put into your course. We also have a full summer folder structure. Um, if you want a full course structure placed into a summer course, and just a reminder about the CEUs that you can get for this session. Um, so for those of you that have to sign off, thank you so much for all you're doing for the students. Thank you so much for attending today. For those of you that can stick around, I will stay and answer questions on tests. Um, or whatever else you might have. All right, <laughs> thank you. Sort of a sprint to the finish there. Um, what questions are out there, Janet? Hey, Melissa. So I think we've been answering most of them in the in the chat. Some of them are a little okay. bit more specific. So if your question was specific and you didn't get it answered in the chat, please use the link to the online support form and submit the question and we will get back. Oh, you cut out there, Janet. Maybe that was intentional. All right, while we're waiting for I'm going to pop up that last. So as Janet said, if you have any questions, feel free to 
pop them in the chat. If Janet's not able to read them to me, if anyone else in the academy sees a question come in, you can feel free to shoot that out to me. Otherwise, um, please make use of our uh, online instruction support form. The, our support for you doesn't end with these webinars, not by, not by any means. So as you think through these things that you're learning in the webinars and you want to learn more, submit a request, the online instruction support form, and you know, hear more about this particular aspect of tests or assignments or um, group work or presentations, you know, anything that, any questions that you have, you can submit them to us and we can respond to you individually um, as these weeks go on and you're working through this transition. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, I'm kind of looking in the chat and it looks like they're um, wrapping up the chat. So I will, um, I will sign off. Thank you so much for attending today. Thank you for everything that you are doing for your students um, and for showing compassion and your, your modeling of lifelong learning and trying these new things. So with that, I will sign off and um, thank you all and have a wonderful day. Stay safe.